And uh, welcome, everybody. Great turnout for this webinar. And uh, we appreciate everyone coming for this such a important subject matter. Um, we're going to try to keep this, uh, um, you know, very informative uh, in light as well. Um, we've got some great panelists here. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves um, and uh, give us a prediction for the Super Bowl winner this year. So uh, why don't we kick that over to Michael King? Uh, unmute, Mike. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't get old. Me, but uh, well, welcome uh, everybody. Um, I think the Lakers will win the Super Bowl. That's all. Um, but all. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm a, a, a long time part of the uh, One Ed Tech uh, community. Well, IMS I was on the board for many years till Rob threw me off. Um, I think it's all term limits, but uh, he was probably happy to see that come up. But I was at IBM most of my career uh, and retired and dove straight into the startup world. And I'm chief growth officer at GG4L. And we're doing uh, really tackling some of the major challenges around school, how schools do data exchange uh, with their ecosystem. Bill, we'll kick it over to you. Hey, I'm Bill Lohman, the technology administrator for the Vernon Parish School Board um, and have been in this position for six and a half, seven years and have really seen that growth going on. But uh, see, Super Bowl until uh, last Sunday, I thought it was going to be the Cowboys. So I'm not <laughs> sure what's going on. <laughs> uh, how about Kevin? Hello, everyone. I am the data privacy officer here at One at Tech. Um, I work with our suppliers in schools. I'm kind of in a unique position where I'm that middleman. I get to hear all of the frustrations and the complaints from our suppliers and from our schools, and I connect them and, and we talk about it. Um, Texans, if you watched last Sunday's game, you know CJ Stroud is going to lead us to the Super Bowl, so that's who, <laughs> that's my prediction. We're going to win it this year. <laughs> All right, Rob, you're up. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Rob Abel here. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for the One EdTech Consortium, formerly known as IMS Global Learning Consortium. So those of you that uh, know us, thank you. Those of you who don't, uh, we're a nonprofit member organization. We have about <clears throat> 950 members around the world. And each of the members is an organization. They might be a school district, or they might be a state department of ed, or they might be a university or a university system or a supplier. Um, and they all working together to build what we call the open, trusted, and innovative ed tech ecosystem based on uh, open standards. And uh, I guess I'm going to say the Eagles because no. Paris from Philadelphia. And yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I don't personally have a favorite, I'll have to say. But, oh, yeah. You just made a lot of Eagles fans happy on this webinar. I got to tell you, <laughs> yeah, dedicated fans over there in Philly. Dedicated mm -hmm. fans. Um, okay, my name's Leo Bram. Uh, I'll be moderating this discussion today. Um, quick history about myself. Um, 22 year school CIO. Uh, did a short stint of about six years uh, with an ed tech space with a company called Catch On, which is now Digital Insight uh, by Lightspeed, and um, have done some uh, recently returned to the um, school district level uh, at the Taunton Public Schools, which is a small gateway city in Massachusetts of about 8,000 students. Uh, and in uh, you know, as many of you know, on this call, our, you know, the last six years has been an amazing uh, growth in the technology use and the leveraging of innovation across industries to help us reach students in different ways and enhance their learning um, and monitor and track their progress. And, you know, without organizations like One Ed Tech, uh, you know, those technologies, those innovations would really be walled off from us and we wouldn't be in a in a place where we are today. But one of the things that that creates is, you know, an unfortunate opportunity for, you know, data leakage and um, the ability to lose student data, which is um, obviously a really important issue for us. So, um, you know, it falls in line with cybersecurity, but then it goes right into human practices within our school districts and, uh, and other things. So we're really excited to talk about this because it's a really important uh, subject matter. Um, and, you know, I get to commend One Ed Tech. I've 
Um, as people on this call know, I've been a part of the One Ed Tech for a long community for a long time and very supportive in all the organizations I belong to and encouraged participation as it has been what has um, allowed the ed tech space to really take advantage of these innovative tools. And uh, I will thank Kevin and Rob for your work uh, and the rest of the one ed, and Kara and the rest of the one ed tech team uh, for your years of uh, service and particularly around uh, the work around trusted apps, uh, you know, has definitely been, you know, a very comprehensive approach for us to start leveraging that um, you know, within school districts. And so thank you. So uh, without further ado, I do want to kick this off. Um, I'm The first question I'm going to fire off over to Bill. Um, and I think, uh, Kara, if you want to, is it a good time now, Bill, to share the uh, the image? Yeah, be a great time. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so uh, Bill, how has the rapid growth of ed tech influenced data privacy in your district? Well, it's it's probably the rapid growth was the hit of COVID. We were on a planned one-to-one -one implementation, you know, small school district in rural Louisiana, um, never really a lot of money. We were using Title I funds to put about a thousand Chromebooks a year out and then boom, COVID hits, kids have to go home and we're standing there with our pants down. Um, don't have enough devices. Uh, Teachers don't know how to use uh, Google, blah, 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 go on, so on and so forth. So so we do the best we can to catch up. Um, Clever was our our uh, our first and only option at the time, um, and we just signed on. The state has many rules for PII. We, we think we're, we're covering them. We're getting our data sharing agreements done, um, getting all that going, but it, it, it's I, I likened it to kind of, you know, I've been married for 25 years, so I don't forget, remember dating, but, but dating someone. And then after you break up with them, you figure out how many person that other, that person you broke up with was dating. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, uh, I really would like to know where my data is going. Um, I don't know where my data is going. And then when Google starts their API changes, um, uh, this October, I realized, I truly realized how that login with Google button was killing me and um, outside of it, outside of uh, the normal Google apps. And then it got my brain to turning on, okay, so what is really being shared? Um, what What's being shared? Why was Facebook, TikTok, why were all these things showing up on my filter when students were using ed tech apps was it something in the 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 code was it something on an ad was it what was it and where's it going and who's allowing this to happen so you know we've got our pii governance console up here and you see the at-risk applications and, and leo mentioned the end user so i do instructional technology as well as the it end and the weakest part of the chain is the end user so part for me was what are students sharing outside of, of our data sharing agreements? What are teachers? What are my staff? What is everybody doing? Because they just don't know. It's again, someone talked about um, building the plane while we were flying it. Exactly. Um, uh, we don't know what we don't know. And I think having been able to see the 1400 Google apps that were used last year, um, inside of the Google API. And then I see 763 at-risk applications and only 16 are at one ed tech approved. It makes me wonder where my data is going. Quick story, student gets on Discord, starts getting in an argument with someone and they fish him. He, uh, he puts all of his uh, information into Discord, not at school, but uh, they, they get a uh, Facebook they set up a Facebook account in his name and uh, one of my schools gets a threat that they're going to get bombed. And um, guess what? The state police, the FBI and the local sheriff's office show up at this boy's doorstep. He has no knowledge. He doesn't understand how his name got on there, but guess what? He shared his information online in a phishing. So it got, for me, it boils down to that last 
that what is our most susceptible person and how can we tell what's being shared outside of and inside of our data sharing agreements. Was this something you wanted to point out on that image too, Bill? Before yeah, we... I, I think the big part for me on the image is that when you look at the EdTech approved, now Eric, we're working through, Thank you. do I need to zoom in some? Show sure. which, um, which part? When you look at the top left, there's 763 at-risk applications. And when you look at this, this is the GG4L PII governance console. We've we've signed up with GG4L. We feel like it's worth paying a little bit of money to, to have a better input into what we're doing. Um, but the, the dashboard is the GG4L PII governance piece. It's an extension that runs um, inside of my Google console and it tracks what apps are being used. So when I start using this console, we will start going to all the teachers and staff as well as the vendors and saying, okay, our people are using you. So now we're gonna get this, we're gonna figure out what you're sharing, what, what you want us to share, what you're sharing with someone else, and come to an agreement on what that should be. Because guess what? It's our data. It may be their software, but it's our data in the end. Um, this shows us uh, the one EdTech approved. And I'll let the EdTech, uh, got one EdTech guys tell us how those approvals happen. Um, we have not gone in and approved any applications through this yet. We're in the implementation phase. And everything's considered at risk because we're still going through that process. But I wanted you to see what that looked like from a perspective of, you know, your high usage rips, high usage apps, and what's at risk. Awesome, thank you so much for you know, I see that seven sixty three looks like a high number. That's it's like you got some work cut out for you. That's more than I have data sharing agreements for. My, uh, uh, yeah, kind of. I had hair before we started sharing data. So. <laughs> well, well, and this is not unique to, you know, this is not unique to you, Bill. And there's a, there's a couple of folks um, in the chat that we were just mentioning that as well. And thank you. They had asked to explain the, the dashboard. So, um, but, you know, uh, it would be interesting to hear, Rob, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, the, uh, the issues in the industry that have emerged around this data privacy piece? Yeah, yeah, I like. I like uh, it's a. It's. Uh, I'm going to kind of follow up a little bit on on what Bill uh, discussed because what he's what he's showing and discussing is not uncommon at all. Um, you know, essentially, we have a situation with the rise of, you know, the uptake of digital applications and platforms in education, especially in K-12. Uh, we we work in higher ed as well, um, but uh, K-12 has a uh, a very a much larger footprint in terms of the number of digital applications they're using. And so it leads to a lot of complexity in the in the institutional, you know, school district or statewide ecosystem. And uh, there's a number of other factors too, right? So the there there are many, many small tech providers in the education sector. Even some of the larger ed tech providers in ed tech are pretty small. Companies and I'm going to that, that's important to understand. Um, but of course, many of the school districts are also very very small. And but even in the larger districts, there's varying levels of centralized control in terms of what digital products are selected and used, right? And and somehow controlled. So in other words, you have a lot of end user decision making that can be going on and this 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 gets back to the process issue Leo that you kind of mentioned in the in the intro but what this means of course is that we're seeing like a dramatic rise in the movement of data pertaining to students between applications or even worst case um, it, and we'll probably get to the point of why it's the worst case uh, I think uh, I think Bill alluded to it being collected by the applications themselves, right? Being co co collecting PII or personal data themselves, but also moving data around because the platforms, you know, we have interoperability standards such as one roster and learning tools interoperability, which have become quite popular. Um, and, but th those actually mean that more data is, is moving around. So it's very, very important to understand how to use those standards correctly 
so that that data is protected. And I think that's one of the things we're going to get to here in this discussion. Um, uh, you know, the information itself here, of course, is private information about students, right? So, so, so this is very, very sensitive information. It's at least as sensitive as healthcare information. I was doing a little research, uh, and uh, I noticed that from the uh, GAO, the General Accounting Office of the U.S. government, uh, there was some data. It's a little bit dated, but in 2020, some 1.2 million uh, students were impacted by um, cyber uh, attacks in schools. And uh, I don't have any more recent data than that, but I assume that it's been just as high or going higher. The other thing we need to understand is we also have new technologies like AI. Everybody's talking about AI. AI is a data hungry application. AI cannot function without collecting data, right? So um, we also have a lot of interest in the usage of data by school districts and institutions that they can collect the data and analyze the data, right? Which which brings to the question, the, for the whole question of, well, do they have the rights to do that? Has that been approved and so forth? So, so all of the all of those issues to me, kind of get to we're we're requiring we require a level of preparation and really awareness in terms of the processes and the potential safeguards that are that are really difficult for even the best resource school districts or universities even or suppliers to achieve. So we have to work together to systemize trust. The one thing we have in education is, is uh, that's really powerful is the ability to collaborate as colleagues and peers, especially when we have you know, a mutual cause which we're collaborating around. And uh, one of the things we've done is created something called Trusted Apps, and that's the, the, the certification that Bill was pointing to, which really is about transparency. It's not about a guarantee of anything, but it's about the transparency that we can understand and ask these suppliers, these app providers to come forward and really indicate very clearly what is in their privacy policy and what is not in their privacy policy. And then we have a, a massive collaboration amongst the members um, that actually helps to utilize that and, and to make their uh, uh, decisions about technology, make their ecosystems more more valuable, but uh, uh, more um, less vulnerable, and, and basically, you know, what this there's there are many moving parts. There are a lot of vulnerabilities, and our approach is to really collaborate in those. And some of that collaboration also occurs in the standards itself, making the standards more foolproof uh, in terms of protecting uh, student data. And and I have to say that I agree with you 100. percent I think that the you know that work around has really eased uh, the pain on school districts around that work around uh, the trusted apps. And you know, I would love it. Kevin. Could you take a little time and just tell us a little bit about that work and what goes into that? Yeah. Uh, so the the trusted apps work it's 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 been very valuable um, for schools, suppliers, one ed tech, um, everyone involved in the process. Um, it, it takes a lot of collaboration um, to promote that transparency that Rob was talking about. So we work closely with the supplier, um, educate them, keep them involved in what their customers or potential customers would yeah, do. Could you just define supplier for our audience too? I know that's kind of a term we use at the one attack. Yeah, supplier yeah. Or, or vendor, um, any then, okay. organization that has a, an ed tech product. Um, so your suppliers you. or vendors, um, we work closely with them to help them understand what the districts are talking about, what those conversations are, what they expect. Um, if you've seen our privacy rubric, we, you see that we've had set it as expectations because it is a collaboration. It is meant to promote communication between our suppliers and our schools to, to promote that transparency and to promote that collaboration. Um, so we point out areas in their policies that are um, sort of interpreted wrong or that don't read too well or that mis are misleading or too sort of um, legalese to understand, um, help them clarify a lot of issues. We um, educate them on what is not acceptable to a lot of districts and we help sort of clear the path both ways. Um, talk to schools, let them know why suppliers or our vendors are doing certain things certain ways 
or why certain statements, um, what a certain statement in their policy actually means. So there's a lot of working together. That collaboration is the, the biggest key um, in our reviews. Um, so we we call them trusted, trusted apps, um, trusted reviews, because there's been a collaboration there. We've worked with the supplier or that vendor. Um, we've worked with the school district. And so all three of us coming together to understand what's actually their privacy posture um, to get the, the best result possible. So you can trust that the review is as accurate as it can be. That's awesome. And, you know, some of the things that you cover, uh, like um, the standards like FERPA and other mm -hmm. Uh, that cover those areas. That was some of the aha moments I had when I first saw trusted apps. Um, mm -hmm. That it goes beyond, you know, um, your standard D, you know, DPA, right? Um, and it goes into, you know, uh, data security in the background. It's very thorough, and and I thank you again for that because I thought it was extremely telling for me when I first started using it, um, and as I will be using it with my current school district as well. So uh, thank you again for that. So. Um, and um, any other advancements or, or changes? I know how many uh, how many entries do we have in the uh, in the catalog today? Ooh, I think we are a little past ten thousand seven hundred or so. Wow, that's amazing! In, in oh, that is way up there. Yep, awesome. Um, so, Mike, what kind of technology approaches can you know can we take in the industry uh, to address some of the challenges we've heard? Uh, from Bill and we're seeing in the text thread, um, you know, in the chat thread, uh, you know, around what, what can what can folks like Bill and myself do uh, or what, what are the approaches the industry is starting to take uh, that might help us, you know, deal with this? Yeah, well, I, I think one of the things that excites me about what we're doing with gg 4 l is through our school passport platform. It's a data exchange for schools that protects student PII. We make it easy for vendors and districts to implement it and use it. So, the idea from what we do is, you know, you have today, as as Rob mentioned, lots of data exchange happening through one roster, um, other uh, services where most of the applications in the district are taking some and replicating uh, student data uh, for their operation. Um, you know, I don't, you know, Bill has over eight, almost 800 apps in, in his district. Uh, I think I've seen studies that say the average district has 1,400 apps um and so you, you know these applications have really proliferated and so what we believe as a data exchange we were initially uh, more vendor funded we've launched a school district version that you saw bill showed up a, our uh, pii governance console that allows us to monitor everything that's happening in a district uh where applications are are, uh, are sharing data so that we can give uh, the district granular control down and, you know, initially see what that inventory of apps are. Uh, we have a partnership with one ed tech so we can show uh, which of those applications are in the trust ed program and uh, allow, uh, allow the districts to drill into that. But more importantly, we're building out the capability to then control uh, which PII or what data actually goes to particular vendors. And what I believe where we need to head to as an industry uh, is ultimately trusting no one. Uh, there is a term of in the, the IT industry today called zero trust. The idea being you shouldn't trust anybody. Uh, and we may never get to that that point in a school district. There are certain vendors and suppliers, obviously, that districts that create PII are going to be managing it for you. But certainly, we can do a lot better than having a thousand vendors that are accessing student data. And so, we think there are opportunities to build technology so that we can let these vendors and applications continue to operate, but to do this in a way where we restrict the sharing of PII data and maybe just you know obviate or uh, eliminate the need to even have a data privacy agreement because they're not getting any data. And if we can do that, uh, you know I think it starts to streamline the operation for the districts a lot. It reduces risks for vendors. You know, we're doing uh, pilots today with some vendors that don't uh, aren't you know, larger vendors that work in the education space, but they don't even want to touch student data uh, if it's for uh, someone under the age of 18. So by filtering out the student data uh, as, as a data exchange from the district, you know, we allow them not to have to sign DPAs, which they don't want to do across uh, you know, uh, thousands of districts in, in the country. 
So I think the opportunity here, and one of the things that we'll talk hopefully a bit more about uh, is collaborating with One EdTech on this notion of an anonymized One Roster, that we could begin to anonymize the data that goes out to vendors. Uh, and so we want to be able to provide the tools to monitor what's happening, and at the same time, uh, provide a, a framework so that over time, we begin to reduce the amount of data that's going off to vendors. Thank you, Mike. You know, and I'm seeing some chatter too around around the use of DPAs. And, you know, I want to say that, you know, one of the comments I would make that, you know, we continue to still use DPAs as well in the process. Um, but I think this has got a, little, a technical lens uh, with that. And I see some of the chat they're talking about uh, STPC, uh, which, um, you know, I've been a part of uh, since its inception and my time in the Newton Public Schools here in Massachusetts with Steve Smith. Um, and it, it really, really, shined a light on the issue. Um, and I would say that, you know, one of the things I think is we do kind of work, um, these are working uh, together and not against each other. So I would say that, um, and I was gonna just quickly share my screen to give an idea of um, what some of the, um, you know, one of the areas that I thought was really uh, exceptional is not only would I, if I would have a DPA um, with a, a certain um, school, you know, with a certain product, you know, I could also kind of get a little bit of background on um, from One Ed Tech about their compliance in other areas, not just what they're telling me they're going to do in their agreement with me. And I thought that that was very helpful in that particular item, you know, in that particular space. So, you know, and as the industry grows, um, I think working hand in hand um, with those folks together is going to be very much more powerful for us. Um, and in that, you know, in that work, Bill, what is the largest time suck, if you will, around this entire subject, right? Around DPAs, around managing those lists. What do you, and I know you're just starting to use this dashboard too. So I guess the first thing I would say is what was it before you had access to the governance dashboard? What are you hoping that that governance dashboard is going to do for you? Well, I, I can go back to before it was our student information system to clever to apps and i my student information system still does crons and still still uh, uh does some older type processing and i don't know exactly what they're sending and i can't see what they're sending until it goes in the next day obviously with what i'm doing now i'm going to go sys to gg4l and then GG4L to the app. So I know exactly what my sys is sharing in one sync, not 50 syncs or 150 syncs. And then with GG4L, I can say, this is the stuff I want to share. The vendor can say, or the partner can say, this is what I want to request. And then we somewhere meet in the middle for, for what they need and what we need. Because look, I was on that side of the desk. I was a I, I I worked in ed tech um, in sales for a while. And uh, for me, it's, you know, we meet somewhere in the middle to meet both of our needs, but we make sure both of us are covered, make sure both of us are, are, are doing right by each other, um, which typically they typically are. Um, I just want to have that. Now, the thing that takes up the most time is double and triple checking, going back and forth and waiting, you know, 24 hours for the sink to happen overnight not being able to do an instant sync and 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 again just in my bio i was a texas state trooper so i tend to investigate so investigating what what's happening where takes time and that's probably more on me but but i think if i have one sys sync and then everything else flies off from there it makes me feel like i uh um makes me feel like it's not easier it's just more streamlined and i like the one comment about making dpas obsolete with anonymized data i i, I think you know our our uh, privacy agreement is one that was done at one school district in the state in 2014. how much has changed since 2014 and that's the one the state recommends um uh they could have imagined in 2014 what we're looking at now as far as our as far as our ed tech so but yeah mostly it's just tracking all the loose ends down um leo 
Bill, I got to tell you, your story about Facebook is making me uh, going to go and steal my kids' names on Facebook and just register them so no one else does. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, hey, yeah. it, 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 I'm sure that wasn't a thing in 2014 that, you know. No, it wasn't. Um, so um, uh, I think it's important to also realize a lot of you know data privacy agreements don't really have enforcement mechanisms, right? So you can audit these vendors, but you have a lot, you have hundreds of vendors in the district that you might have to audit, which doesn't seem realistic. And as Rob said, some of these are large vendors, some are small. And so I think to the extent that we can just reduce the need to have these DPAs and reduce the number that are out there, it becomes a lot more manageable than trying to do it across a population of hundreds of, of potential vendors. Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing you say that, Michael. I, going back to the technology, I mean, the DPAs is, you know, what people have now, uh, you know, for peace of mind. And um, but that brings me to, you know, what's next, right? And how are how are we going to help take control of that? And I guess that, you know, you use the term anonymized one roster, anonymized data, you know, Rob or Kevin or Michael, can you can you guys define it or explain it? Uh, um uh, in more layman's terms of what that actually means, um, you know, in the, you know, in the context of, you know, a, a tool being used within a school district? I, I can try and uh, we'll see how it goes. So, so the, uh, <laughs> you know, basically, basically the idea here is that if you're exchanging data via an interoperability standard, that means the way the data is being exchanged is very well defined and in both directions, right? Rostering in one direction, data back in another direction. So you've got a standard in place now. So the first step is to make sure the, the um, suppliers, um, you know, the vendors are in fact implementing the standards, right? Then the next, then, then the, ne the next point is that, well, if you're implementing the standards, you can very easily diagnose what is actually moving across, right? You can you can have a tool set that allows you to understand what's moving across. So you can actually see, you can actually put a listener on that line and see whether there's there's PII moving across. Now the now the idea behind the anonymized one roster is to say that simply put, we will utilize the standard, but we will anonymize that ID before it goes across the line when it to the other system when it comes when the data comes back that anonymized id will be there and it will be de-resolved if you want to call it resolved back to actually who the user was back in the system so and so what that so the overall so so essentially what we're creating with anonymized one one roster is a standard that that controls it's a framework standard that controls what data can be passed and to whom and, and therefore give someone like Bill complete control over which applications are going to get what data, which is very important. So it's, so we're talking, because we're talking about, yeah, let's just say no PIIs moving across, so we don't need DPAs or whatever, but actually for some products, it might actually be important for, for, for some, some amount of personally identifiable information to go across. But the point is that Bill can manage that and he can also, through tools like what Gigi Farrell is providing, control that and even monitor it, even monitor it, understand exactly what's going on. So a lot of this to me is like giving the districts the tools they need in order to be able to manage this complexity. And that's what anonymized one roster, essentially it's a framework and it can be applied actually to any of our standards. We call it anonymized one roster because we're talking about one roster here, but the same exact process can be applied to learning tools interoperability LTI, which a lot of folks use as well. Gotcha. Um, okay, that was um, that's that's helpful. And Mike or, or Kevin, yeah, well, I, I would just say, you know, I think one of the things. I mean, there's obviously, you know, we can get into the into the the technology in, deep deep in the technology here and pseudo anonymization, anonymization, and so forth. But the bottom line is, it's it's it it, it fundamentally it will be better for everyone if we stop sending data to lots of vendors across the ecosystem. I always characterize school districts are like a bank vault and we worry about the strength of the door and the quality of the lock on the front, but there's no wall in the back of the vault. There are literally hundreds of vendors coming in day in, day in, day out, taking data out. Uh, that's not a really good model. And just to have them sign a DPA when they come in and pay, take your data out, I mean, that's kind of, okay, well, if, if there is a leak, we're sort of covered. It's an administrative tool, but it doesn't really prevent the loss of data. 
And I think, you know, when we think about cybersecurity in schools, I, I think, you know, uh, in 2016, you know, you said 1.2 million students, 1,300 hacks in 2016, which the K-12 Security Information Exchange says is probably 10 to 20 times more than that. Um, people fixate on the ransomware, um, the, the cost to districts, but one of the things that flies under the radar is students losing their identity. I mean, there's a massive amount of credit fraud, tax, even tax fraud. A lot of times students don't discover this until they go to apply for a student loan or an apartment after they become adults. And then they've learned that their data was hacked and they've been, somebody's been, you know, exploiting their, their identity to rack up credit. And those don't make the headlines of the New York Times, but it's out of those 1.2 million students, that's a problem. And, and frank, frankly, one of the biggest hacks in education happened in New York with a, a major vendor that their system was hacked, not the school district. So I think if we if we can really put the wall in the back of this vault and start to reduce this number, the amount of data that's flowing out there, you know, when you go to Target and you check out and put your credit card in, they're not sending your credit card information out uh, willy nilly across the internet. We we have the technology to fix this problem, and I find that some people get it. Uh, a lot of times, I think it's. Uh, uh, you know, an issue that people just don't want to confront. But I think, uh, you know, with, with, with the work we're doing with Rob and the team around this anonymized one roster concept is if we push this forward, and I would just make an invitation to districts and vendors alike to let's collaborate on this together. We've got a meeting coming up in, in Atlanta, I think in November, where we're going to have some workshops on this topic. But this is an opportunity really to use technology and, and really uh, uh, change the way we do this data exchange across our ecosystem. And that's just gonna have tremendous benefit, not just to districts, but particularly to the students that are finding their data, you know, making its way out. So place. Mike, Mike I'm, I'm taking this question right out of the chat. And just so I understand, uh, and I think I understand how this works. It says, how do they, um, if it's anonymized, how do they you get a hold of the information they do need? And I think I understand if, as I understand, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, through the, your platform, if the vendors utilizing the standard that Rob mentioned, um, Bill could, or myself in my district could select, let's say, um, a, a product only needs first name, last name, and email address to function, um, that would be sent anonymized with a key on one end. And because there's a solid connection on the other end, they'll have the key to... Uh, unencrypt it so that they can be used accordingly on the well, other end. Well, vendors don't really need to have that identity information. So we can, you know, the idea is we can- yeah, Like first initials, so they, like the two initials. Yeah, they, 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 so their application will operate normally. And that's this idea with the anonymized one roster. But I think over time, you know, a lot of the technology, for example, that's used in FinTech, we could begin to use here where, um, you know, we can still provide vendors the ability to operate normally, even with, anonymized uh, or, or masked data, encrypted data that uh, they don't have access to, to seeing it. So we think, you know, it's not going to be, a, you know, we're never going to take you know, the, the bills, 800 vendors and, and you know, convert them all to not consuming PII. But the, the idea would be at least half of them or more perhaps don't need any PII and can still operate normally. Okay. Uh, a few others may need some PII and, and we can kind of give Bill the tool to see what those are, to kind of move to a process where he's down to a smaller, more manageable number of, of applications that actually do require the student PII and, and that he can track that and control it a lot more simply than uh, kind of the Wild West that we have today. I think so, Bill has a comment. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, there, we're, we're talking about the whole PII and data piece, but there's a teaching and learning cost to this too, is we spend a lot of money on software and you know we don't buy all those 800 apps and and if i could get my leadership which is something i work on daily is get them to limit their purchasing to to people or programs that do follow pii and will do a data privacy agreement and have school based leadership direct their teachers towards you know, the programs that the states approve, the district has approved for curriculum instead of something that, that is, a, is, is essentially a game, uh, which I see my kids wasting time on all the time. Um, I, I think there's the cost of the data cost, and I think there's the, uh, 
the, the teaching and learning cost of time wasting and and doing things that don't meet the curriculum requirements. Yeah, that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. Um, Kevin, you you've been uh, slinking away here, getting away with some comments. So I'm gonna gonna put you on the spot next. You know how how can we educate school officials uh, and staff? Have you found in your work with One Ed Tech and some of your um, partner districts? um ways that they're been able to explain and educate their staff um you know in leadership about this initiative and you know why it's important and why to adopt it yeah um I, I think it's important to for our districts to just get involved um we we promote communication is the, the biggest key here um between our suppliers or vendors and our schools being able to just talk to them directly, ask questions. Most suppliers will, you know, it's business as usual as far as the amount of data they collect and use. Um, and they don't know any better until someone points it out that you're you're asking for too much. So I would say definitely just get involved. Um, get involved in the work. If there's a task force or a work group or committee that's doing this work, get involved. Invite your supplier, vendor members, um, and invite neighboring school districts. Just get involved um, in the work because you know, if we, I, I want to stress data minimization. If you're a supplier, data minimization principle, practice that to, to the utmost. Never collect more than you need and we could be in a better situation. So we don't have to worry about protecting large amounts of data or anonymizing it if you practice that data minimization principle. But just get involved overall. So, you know, and, that, and that's a great point, uh, that getting involved part, Kevin. Like I would say, you know, a, uh, an old friend of uh, one ed tech tim beekman was the one that approached me and said you know you have to join this thing called i at the time ims global and if i remember correctly it was a fairly low bar uh to to pay just to be a, an affiliate member i think or some sort of membership to be a part of it um and i did want to get more involved so obviously there was there was more to that but you know uh, rob and and kevin could you tell us a little bit about how districts so people who are listening today can get signed up, get their name on there uh, and get involved with the organization. Uh, then maybe talk a little bit about the, the, your event next week, uh, which I know is all the last minute for people to maybe sign up and get there. But <laughs> um, but it is in Georgia. And I know we have some folks on here from Georgia, so they could probably come and attend. So yeah, if you, you live close to Atlanta, it's it's in Atlanta next week. Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me just say thanks. Thanks for the commercial. We weren't really actually looking for that but, uh, for one ed tech. But, right. but, but, <laughs> but that's no, important. But, it's but, the important. Reality, but the reality is, is that that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to make it really easy for districts to work with each other on this and for districts to also work with suppliers and suppliers to work in concert with what districts want to do. That's why we have 950 members and we've been growing very dramatically. We're banning about 100 members a year now. But we also, you know, so, so the type of things you'll see next week, it, it, you know, right along the lines of what you're talking about, we have something called Tackle, the Trusted App Certified Leader program, it's actually a certification. It's a professional development certification you can get. And one of the modules is just in this area of privacy and security, right? And we're going to be adding accessibility to that too as well, because we have a new rubric coming out for accessibility. That will occur. We have those at every time we get together. We get together three time, times a year in the U.S. face-to-face. -face, and we also can do, do regional things from time to time. That's something that is, it's about, it's not just about learning about what we have to bring to the table, but it's also talking to your colleagues and strategizing about how you are dealing with these issues in your district. In fact, I would say that's probably the most valuable part of it, of the whole interaction. You have experts like Kevin there involved in that as well, but, but that, but, but you're also going to see uh, in the, you know, it's kind of the, so we have these technical sessions also that are going to dig very deeply into the anonymized one roster. People have asked, how can they get involved? It's actually very close to being a, a real thing. We've been working on it for uh, a year now. And uh, there's an overall framework, which is more generalized, but the ability to certify to this idea of not passing any PII, that's something that we're very close to be able to do, but you'll, there'll be technical meetings on that um, at the Atlanta sessions. Um, but there'll also be states like Georgia uh, talking about how they've implemented the Trusted Apps dashboard uh, statewide. Um, and the reason that's a, 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 through something we call TAMPS, the, the 
Trusted Apps Management Suite, which is basically a set of software that will do that will display the privacy policy rubric, which itself is a standard um, on these 10,000 plus apps that Kevin uh, mentioned that have already been vetted. And and so so th so that'll be talked about. You, you'll hear about how Georgia has actually implemented that statewide. It's also been implemented statewide in South Carolina, and there are several other states that are that are implementing it. Meaning every district has access to that because the smallest districts are the ones that really need this information the most. And the reason that that's important is that even if you're not passing any PII, well, that application might be going directly to the user and gathering PII. And that's yeah. covered in the privacy policy. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we have to work together to hold the vendors to, to understand what's going on, the transparency, and to prevent that if we feel that's a problem as well. But it'll be a great meeting. There'll probably be about 200, 250 people there. So it's not a gigantic meeting, but it's robust and a lot of leadership from school districts in particular at this particular meeting. Well, and I would say one one other thing, but I did like open up to some questions. Um, we have a very active, uh, every active chat over here. <laughs> We'll tell you <laughs> very active back channel, which I love. Um, but you know, maybe Mike and Rob, this might be a question to the both of you: is what is the best way for our audience here to um, encourage um, their? I I know they know how to call. It, I I see them on the chat. I know how to they encourage their peers. But perhaps you know they hit their list of uh, applications um, that are being used. And they want to encourage those applications to start taking advantage of putting on their roadmap uh, development for uh, this anonymized one roster. Is it something that they can go directly to GG Pharrell for, directly to one ed tech, both? What does that process look like? Hey, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll start and then let Rob comment on the one ed tech piece. Uh, you know, we as a vendor are building this in our data exchange. So our we're uh, we're now uh, in in a beta about to go into production with the, the PI governance console, which which Bill shared a piece of that. Uh, we've been working now with some vendors. Uh, Coursera is one of the biggest we work with. We actually have enabled them to bring their career academy into K twelve and the into CTE departments as a an option for career pathways for students across all the certification industry certifications they have, which I think could be a huge game changer in an important area like skills preparation workforce skills in, in high school. And the reason is we don't share PII, student PII with them. And they had a concern with that. So we worked with a very large school district that had a 70 plus page data privacy agreement. And we got it down to two pages that Coursera had to sign off on, which they would do. So it's been a game changer for them and their ability to work with schools. So we are in fact in production and delivering this uh, with uh, some school districts, with some vendors. We need more. Uh, you know, we need suppliers to come on board and, and work with us to agree and verify that they can operate in this way. We need school districts to work with us and to begin to demand this. And, to, you know, our dashboard integrates the, the trusted information, but we can also monitor what's happening across the district and then go in and give uh, districts tools at the vendor level to go and control that sharing of PII. So we're looking for people that want to help uh, push this technology forward and work with us to, um, to really push it through the ecosystem because it's ultimately going to take a lot of districts and a lot of vendors beginning to do this so that we can get Bill's dashboard from, uh, you know, 800 bit, uh, application sharing data down to some manageable number for him, uh, which we want to do as soon as we can. So I think that's an opportunity. And then, you know, we know this is really going to take off when it when it is part of the one ed tech standard suite so that it's not uh, unique to us. And so that's why we've been collaborating with Rob and the team. Uh, and he can talk a bit more about that, uh, that work. Yeah. Yeah. So the cor the corollary to that is that uh, uh, we really, really, really appreciate Gigi Farrell working with us closely on this to, to push the envelope. That's usually how things, you know, advances occur in standards. Is there some set of suppliers that are really, really working collaboratively closely with the standards organization. So we greatly appreciate that. As Mike said, our process means that we will bring in, we have 500 suppliers who are members of One Ed Tech today. So our goal is to bring in all those other suppliers, right, into the fold and implementing this. And they, we have a specific stages we go through in, what, in the standard. We don't just publish a document and say we have a standard. There are other organizations that do that. We, we don't. We actually make sure that the a certain number of suppliers have implemented, show they can implement, show that there's a way to test that the actual standard is being implemented correctly. 
in this case, the standard we're talking about is the anonymized one roster. And that process could go as fast for us as maybe 60 to 90 days from today to get to the end because there is so much excitement about this. But we'll we'll see. So we'll be making a call to suppliers to get involved. In it. But if you're a supplier out there and want to get involved, basically you just need to contact us. There's a contact us form on our website, and we will be very responsive to getting you, uh, you know, involved and in, in explaining to you uh, your, your options. I also saw a comment in the in the very very active chat about the the implementation of one roster rest. We're very happy to discuss that with you as well and tell you what that that's not something we can talk about just broadly here on the because it's very very nuanced. But we're very happy to talk to you about that. And what you're experiencing think, and how we can help with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that person is wants their SIS that they have to adopt it, and uh, yeah, that's a that's a whole long conversation. I'm sure we could have a whole webinar well, on adoption. <laughs> we can work on that. We can work yeah. on that, right? So, because we agree, we agree with your yep. point of view. So, yes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that there's um, you know, and to that point, I'd I'd like to turn it over to questions. Uh, there were some questions here about one ed tech and some others, and I'm happy to synthesize, you know, to water them down here or, or bring them forward as collectively. Um, but around adoptions, you know, um, adoption of standards by vendors, you know, it is up to us. That is one of the things that um, I appreciated the role of one ed tech. Uh, and I know the role of one ed tech will do this for anonymized one roster. Um, before one roster was adopted by everybody, um, it was up to the collective power of us as practitioners to come together uh, and put this, you know, put the push on vendors to adopt things like single sign on and one roster. And, you know, it was a short six years ago, we were still fighting that battle. Whereas today, that is, you know, that is just an expectation. If you are, um, you know, a vendor who has any kind of use of rostering to make a teacher's life easier, you really need to adopt one roster, um, you know, and that is, um, that's just a given today. And, and that is a big, you know, big piece of success. And I think this next step of it, and, you know, not to just give another commercial for you, Rob, but, uh, you know, they do more than just one roster at one ed tech. Um, there are other aspects of the industry, you know, and they will, you know, it will require as much security as well, um, moving forward. And so th this is laying the groundwork, uh, you know, for that sec secure ecosystem that us as practitioners are all looking for. You know, we have silos of data living all over our, our learning community um, and making them work together is still a dream of all of us. Um, and these are the steps that are going to make that happen. So, um, OK, so a question is might be to you, Mike. Are you saying that GG4L will be part of One Ed Tech or is it a separate paid service? No, it is. a set. We are a vendor. And so, we're, uh, you know, we do charge for our services. We are a One Ed Tech member and a contributing member. So we're very involved. With with the organization helping foster standards, but we're definitely uh, you know in the in, in business as as a supplier. And I do uh, see a plug for a national DPA, um, and po pointing to one that the um, Student Data Privacy Consortium has done. Yes, it would be nice to have a GDPR like. Uh, I, I echo that. It would be nice for our legislature to do that from a national level. Although I'm not yeah. holding my breath on that, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say I'll just say that One EdTech is very supportive of the uh, Student Data Privacy Consortium work. We think it's very very important, and we think it's very complementary to what to what we're doing, uh, because the you know we have had the districts tell us that the that privacy agreement is very very important component of this as well. As noted, it does not cover the ones we have seen. It does not cover everything that we're covering in trusted apps, as an example. Um, and our job with trusted apps is really to get that information in the hands of the practitioners and the users. That's kind of the key is uh, about privacy security. And I also mentioned accessibility, which is coming very shortly. It's just soon to be out. So, and it also that same data is available that's available in TAMS, the trusted apps management suite could also is also being made available through some data feeds with some of uh, our partners um, that are out there as well. So, we're trying our best to get that information out as widely as possible. Um, and with just a couple of minutes left, I there were a couple of questions about, I believe, the Trusted Apps dashboard. Um, so I'm just going to put it back up there and see if those questions are there still. Um, so please give me one second. Uh, is anyone seeing the Trusted App? Yeah. This is their web page, by the way. I. Uh, 
you know, we, um, but if someone can throw some questions in the chat there, if you have any questions and care, if you wouldn't mind just chiming in what they are or, or Rob or somebody, uh, Early on, um, there was uh, a request to tell us a little bit more about the dashboard. And I think, Leo, it was when you were sharing oh, sure. uh, this page. And um, yeah, I like this is my. Here. Yeah, and I will tell us. What's that? Sorry, last part. And how to get the dashboard. Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, I, the dashboard is definitely available to members uh, of One Ed Tech. And, there, and obviously, we do have um, a membership so that. Some of this data will be displayed, um, you know, in my PII governance uh, and bills dashboard, um, some of this data. And um, I will tell you that there's a pretty comprehensive rubric that Kevin and his team have developed and used to build these out. And you do have to be a, a member, I believe, still, uh, Rob can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to get access to the rubric outcomes on the back end. But um but this data here is a really quick way uh, that uh, I've used in the past and I will continue to use to get an idea of what um, a product's compliance level is. And and to me, it could equate to their commitment to privacy, right? It could be if, if I see that, there, you know, this particular, you know, type of uh, result here, just by glance, well, I would have red flags about this particular tool. Um, and I'm not going to name names because there are some out there. Uh, that are pretty uh, covered in red and yellow over here. <laughs> They're very orange in the sense. And um, again, I just want to point out, I mean, Bill showed our PII governance console. You just mentioned it, Leo. That is the uh, our gg 4 product that does the inventory of uh, applications in use in your district. So we uh, do have an agreement with Rob and the team where we bring in for uh, districts that are uh, one EdTech members, we can embed this uh uh, data from uh, the trusted trust ed program into that console. So not only do we show you which apps are being used in the district, how much it's being used, and then we let you drill right into the specific uh, trust ed data about that application. Uh, and Harry, all you want to quickly throw that up, that image, if you don't mind? Because I know we're about on time, but. So that gives you the kind of the uh, the actual usage within your district, uh, and then you can drill down into each of those applications. And, and uh, if you are one EdTech member, we embed the the trusted uh, data into that uh, into our console as well, so you get the uh, specifics on the application. Well, I um, first I want to thank uh, thank our uh, panel here today uh, for your time. Um, you know, this was a great conversation and um, I took away, even as, you know, the moderator, I took away a lot uh, more learning more about, you know, the trusted apps, um, trust both trusted apps, anonymized one roster. And, you know, I know I'm, I'm getting the governance dashboard stood up on my end, uh, Mike, um, because I'm excited about that. I need it. Uh, Bill, I will tell you, don't feel bad about 700 and change. Uh, mine are uh, closer to 1,000. So uh, <laughs> so I've got my work cut out for me as well. Um, but again, uh, appreciate everybody's time today. Um, there were a couple of questions. Yes, this was recorded. It will be sent out to all registrants. Um, and um, so you will be able to review it. And um, obviously our email and contact info is available for any follow-up questions. Uh, and of course, if you like to learn more about GG4L's uh, product that we discussed today, you obviously reach out to them. And then obviously oneedtech.org, uh, you can find your um, information about One Ed Tech's services and, um, and membership as well. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Leo. See ya. Bye, everyone. Appreciate your time. Bye.